Welcome to basic science class. Before we dive in into today's lesson, can animals live on tree? Can animals live on tree? Or oh, let me rephrase. Do animals live on tree? Okay, okay, wait. Okay, how about this? Are there animals that live on the tree? I know you might have been thinking, okay, can animals live on tree? That means the tree is their home. <laughs> I don't know, maybe you've thought about it, but you know you're going to actually know that animals live on tree. That means the the tree is their home. That is what we are considering today. That will lead us to a topic. Uh, but before that, I would like to put this say this that this is a continuation of the topic habitat and you know we've looked at habitat in the second second video was types of habitat and i said in the second video that we were majorly going to be leveraging terrestrial habitat in that in that video but now we are moving to the last one which is the abari habitat okay if you're lost i want you to check out on that video because we have three types of um, habitat which is terrestrial habitat the aquatic habitat and the arboreal habitat and that is why we are considering the last one here which is the arboreal habitat that's our topic for today but that's not the only thing we are going to be considering in this video we're also going to be considering predators how they adapt and also prey how they adapt so what is the focus for today what is our focus for today at so this at the end of today's lesson at the end of the lesson you should be able to define an arboreal habitat that means if i ask you anywhere or if someone asks you what is an arboreal habitat you should be able to define it not only that you should be able to state the factors that affect arboreal habitats also discuss the adaptation of predators because i said that earlier on that we're not just going to be streamlining ourselves to the arboreal habitat we're also looking at the adaptation of predators so you should be able to discuss adaptation of predators and also discuss that adaptation of prey. So of, of course, you know that there's no predators without prey. They must prey on something. They must eat something. They must feed on another um, organism. So we are going to look at the, the prey too. Are they just living and just watching the predators feed on them? Okay, so what, what adaptation have they put in place to... Um, to avoid being fed on by their predators. So we're going to look at this very quickly. So what are arboreal habitats? Arboreal habitats refer to habitats that are primarily found in trees. So you don't find this kind of habitat in the water, no. You don't find it just anywhere in the soil. They are, this habitat is primarily found in trees. They are characterized by the presence of organisms that spend most of their lives in trees most of their lives their shelter is tree they got their food from the tree and maybe the only thing they may need to source for is water you understand that's what they may need to source for so most of their lives is spent in the trees so what are the characteristics of arbory habitats they are vertically oriented and provide a unique environment for organisms trees provide food provide shelter and safety from predators and they can create complex and interconnected ecosystems. So what kind of vegetations are here in the arboreal habitat? Trees are the dominant vegetation in arboreal habitats. There's no water. The major um, vegetation you're going to find there are trees, not shrubs, not grasses, trees. They provide the structure and resources necessary for arboreal organisms to live and move within the canopy. So various types of trees such as deciduous or coniferous trees can be found in arboreal habitats. So what kind of organisms do you find here? What kind of organisms? There are varieties of organisms you're going to find here. So and they include primates like monkeys and apes. So <laughs> they are found uh, in this kind of habitat. Tree dwelling mammals like squirrels and cowlers, birds that nest and forage in trees, reptiles like snakes and lizards. Of course, most times, if you have a tree in your house or in your environment, you're going to see lizards climbing up and down there. And sometimes it might have been an opportune or fortunate, let me use that word, <laughs> to come across a snake. Hope you didn't run, okay? So you might have opportunity, you might you might have come across a snake or so on the tree because some of them live on the tree. 
and a variety of insects. Of course, there are some trees that are insect infested because what those insects find their shelter there, they find their food there, so they live on such tree. So not only that, it's not only um, animals that you're going to find there. I hope you know that everything I just mentioned there, they're all animals, whether they're insects, squirrels, or primates, or reptiles like snake, they're all animals. Now, but is that the only thing that stays there? No, we have plants that live also in the tree, like epiphytes, plants that grow on trees without being parasitic. So it's a kind of um, symbiosis, it's a kind of um, commensalism, that has a word now, commensalism kind of um, relationship that is occurring between them, you know. In during, when we were considering ecology, we looked at um, symbiotic, symbiotic, and under it, I said there are three types of relationship. Please listen to that video if you have not. You see that video, if you have not maybe so shortly after this or before you continue here so that you can comprehend what I'm talking about so under this symbiotic relationship we have the parasitic parasitic that means one is gaining another is losing we have the mutualistic both are gaining so no one is losing both of them are gaining and the commensalism one is gaining and the other one doesn't have any effect on it so that's the kind of relationship that happens between epiphytes and trees so it's a kind of um commensalism so plants that grow on trees without being parasitic they are not parasitic so like orchids and bromelades are also common in arboreal habitats so what are the factors that affect arboreal habitats factors that affect arboreal habitats so we have number one is the tree species tree species the types of trees present in an arboreal habitat influence the availability of resources like food shelter and nesting sites for arboreal organisms different tree species provide different types of resources so it's not all trees that uh, every arboreal organism can stay on no different species species are meant for some specific organism for example some trees may bear fruits that serve as a food source while others may have specific features like hollows or crevices that provide shelter or nesting site for arboreal organisms so another factor is canopy structure canopy structure the density and structure of the tree canopy affect factors such as sunlight penetration so you know that by now that it's it's um it's rare for sunlight to penetrate some dense canopy so and there are some organisms that need this to grow that need this sunlight like the epiphytes now so there are some trees that cannot be an epiphyte on it that you cannot find epiphytes on them because they're going to obstruct the ray of sunlight and so do, such plants cannot survive there so humidity levels and the availability of macro micro habitats for arboreal organisms subsequently we're going to know what micro habitat is not in the subsequent video no but here in this lesson today so a dense canopy can provide shade and protection from excessive sunlight creating a cooler and more humid environment the canopy structure also creates various micro habitats like branches so when i said something like micro habitat it means branches leaves i hope you if you have seen the first video on habitat we said that a a habitat can be as small as a leaf for insects you know insect leaves they, they live on the leaves so it can be as small so micro habitat like branches some some there are some organisms that live on the branches of the tree there are some that live on the leaves like the insects and tree trunks they burrow into the tree to, tree trunks and they live there like the birds or the woodpecker especially they burrow and they live there which arboreal organisms can utilize for feeding resting and also reproduction the next is vertical space vertical space the availability of vertical space and the presence of branches or vines allow arboreal organisms to move and navigate within the habitat. Vertical space allows them to utilize three-dimensional environments, moving up and down, as well as horizontally along branches. Adaptations such as grasping appendages, prehensive tails, or specialized limbs structures enable arboreal organisms to navigate the vertical space efficiently to so the next 
we're looking at is the availability of food. Do not forget we are considering the factors that affect our real habitats. Just the way we considered for the aquatic habitat and we also look, uh, looked out for the um, terrestrial habitat. So we are still under the, we are still considering the factors that affect the arboreal habitat. So the next is availability of food. And by now you should know that food is a major necessity, is a necessity, is a necessity for every habitat. Food is necessary. So the presence of fruits, leaves, flowers, or other food sources in trees determines the availability of sustenance for arboreal Organisms, different tree species may provide a variety of food sources. Some can provide maybe flowers, some fruit, some leaves, and you know there are some animals that feed on leaves, others do not feed on leaves, they feed on fruits. So dependent on um, the kind of food source or available food in that kind of arboreal habitat, that's what we determine the kind of organisms you were going to see in that habitat. So it's a major factor that also affect arboreal habitats. For example, some trees may produce nectar-rich flowers that attract pollinators. And you know the primary pollinator, pollinators say are insects. So those trees you find mostly that insects live on those trees. They live on those trees. While others may have abundant leaves or fruits that serve as direct food sources for arboreal organisms. So now, the next is predators and competitions. Free is also a factor that affects arboreal habitat. Predators and competition. The presence of predators and competitors in the arboreal habitat influences the behavior and adaptations of arboreal organisms, such as camouflage or specialized climbing abilities. So predators like birds of prey, like hawk, you know, hawk is a predator, or snakes, or arboreal mammals can drive adaptations in prey species. So for them to survive, they will get some, they, those prey will have some adaptation, which we are going to consider shortly after now. So leading to enhanced camouflage or agility in climbing. For example, lion cannot climb trees, hope you know that. And but, so for, for monkey now, you know that lion, uh, lion and monkey cannot they can't stay together. Let me use that word because monkey have appendages to climb trees faster. They have the ability to climb climb trees faster, and lions cannot. So if you are going to leave lion and monkey there, mo uh, lion is going to die of hunger actually because monkey is going to climb the tree which lion cannot. So those prey to have developed some enhanced adaptations like camouflage or agility in climbing to escape from their predators. Competition for resources like food and nesting sites can also shape the behavior and adaptations of arboreal organisms such as territorial behaviors or specialized feeding strategies. So the next is microclimates. Microclimates, even within the arboreal habitat there are climates the level of you know exposure to sunlight and the rest because you know as I earlier said for example in a dust canopy habitat you you might not find some organisms there so you can see because the, the the ray of sunlight will not penetrate very well and maybe some and there are varieties of climates and weather conditions that are, can be available within this microclimate. So within the arboreal habitat, different microclimates can exist due to variations in sunlight exposure, humidity levels, and air flow. Microclimates can be found in areas such as the canopy, tree trunks, or tree hollows. hollows. So these microclimates can provide specialized niches and conditions for different arboreal organisms influencing their distribution and also their behavior. The next is epiphytes and parasites. Epiphytes and parasites. You know now that there are some plants called epiphytes that grows on the tree. And also there are some parasitic plants that also grows on the tree. Now you I, I said this earlier on that some that parasitism occurs when one is gaining and another is losing. So but for epiphytes is commensalism one is gaining and it's not having effect on the other 
So our marine habitat often supports a variety of epiphytes, which are plants that grow harmlessly on other plants, such as mosses, orchids, or ferns. Why these epiphytes can create additional microhabitats and provide resources for aborigine organisms. However, some parasitic plants like mistletoe can negatively impact the health of host trees because they are sharing of the nutrient of the tree, so it can affect the health of those trees and thereby um, reducing their, I mean, their availability for some organisms that may need to thrive in that tree. They will just have to leave and move to another um, tree entirely. So the next is arboreal bridges and corridors. Arboreal bridges and corridors. Some arboreal habitats have may have natural bridges or corridors, such as interconnected tree canopies, lianas or vein, that is vines, or falling logs, that is logs, that's falling trees. Um, Align arboreal organisms to move between trees and habitats. These connections are essential for the dispersal gene flow and maintaining population connect tv too so the, the we also we also have human impact you know human impact the, this <laughs> human impact have affect almost virtually all the um, habitats that we have name it whether be it the aquatic habitats or the terrestrial habitats and then in the arboreal habitats we are still seeing human impacts to there so when you have cases like deforestation you're going to dislodge some some habitats urbanization and habit fragment, habitat fragmentation can significantly affect arboreal habitat. The removal of trees reduces the availability of resources and can disrupt the continuity of arboreal habitat, making it challenging for arboreal organisms to find suitable habitat and navig navigate their environment. So very quickly we have looked at the arboreal habitat and the factors that affect arboreal habitat. Now we want to look at the adaptations of predators. How uh, um, predators, how do they adapt to their environment in order to get food? So uh, you know by now that predators are animals that feed on other animals and mostly they are either carnivorous, carnivorous or omnivores. So they are either carnivores, I mean to say carnivores or omnivores. So predators have evolved a variety of adaptations that aid in their hunting and capturing of prey. These adaptations allow them to effectively locate, pursue, and capture their targets. So we're going to look at their various, various adaptations they have now. We have number one is sharp teeth and claws. Most of predators that you see, some predators you see them have sharp teeth, like tiger as we see in that video, has a very sharp teeth. Predators often possesses, possess sharp teeth and claws that are specialized for capturing and subdue their prey. You know, they can easily use that, that teeth to pin down their prey. See, the pain is going to cause our prey. It might not be able to escape again. So it might even destroy some organs in their body in the, in the process. And so they are, they are dead and they, or they will die and they will feed on them. These adaptations vary among different predator species. For example, Carnivores like lions and tigers have sharp canine teeth for seizing and killing their prey. While raptors like eagles, as you can see in that video, it captures that fish with its claws. And ox have hooked beaks and sharp talons for grasping and tearing their prey apart. So you can see in that video, it grabs that fish with full force. That fish cannot go off its claws. So that's their adaptation that has, may help them to be able to feed over time. So the next thing is keen senses. Keen senses. Predators, predators typically have highly developed senses that help them detect and locate prey. They may have acute vision, enabling them to spot movement or see in low light conditions. You know, hole is an example here. Hole is an example of this. So though it moves at night, but still it can find its prey wherever it's going, even in low light conditions. Some predators like holes have excellent night vision. So the hole is a nocturnal insect, a nocturnal animal, I mean to say, and it move it's very active at night. So it can also find its prey. And additionally, predators often have well-developed hearing or sense of smell. They can easily perceive, perceive their 
and they are prey when it comes nearer and they can also um, prepare themselves for the prey allowing them to detect prey even when it is hidden or camouflaged then the next is speed and agility speed and agility many predators have adaptations for speed and agility allowing them to pursue and capture fast moving prey for instance cheetahs are built for speed with long legs you see the way it's running in that video long legs and flexible spine that enable them to reach incredible speeds in short bursts so once they take their leap with they, they, they cover some distance and they can easily get up meet up with their prey other predators like wolves leopards or dolphins have agile bodies and strong muscles that help them maneuver quickly in pursuit of their prey. So now we're, the next is camouflage and stilts. Camouflage and stilts. Some predators possess adaptations for blending into their surroundings or remaining undetected by their prey. This can include camouflage, patterns on their form. Just as you see in um, the, the video plane, see the pattern on the floor or, or on the f um, of the floor of that animal. So it's blending with the environment. So some prey might not even know that they are there because it looks more like the environment, the white and the, the other color. So it's blended, it's blended. Well. So they would think that it's still, they're still within the environment, not knowing that a prey is coming for them. This can include camouflage patterns on their floor, feathers or skin that help them blend into their environment, making it easier to approach prey unnoticed. Predators like the snow leopard or tiger, that is the snow leopard that, that you see on the video, or tiger have striped patterns that provide excellent camouflage in their respective habitats. The next is specialized hunting techniques, specialized hunting techniques. Predators have evolved specific hunting techniques that maximize their chance of success. Of success, For example, certain snakes use ambush tactics. They just stay low and just wait till their prey gets nearer, then they catch it. So lying in wait for prey to come within striking distance and they don't miss it. Once they strike the, the, the animal, they get it at once because they have developed that tactics of ambush, of staying, lying in wait for prey to come. And they can easily get the prey without the prey notice, no, knowing that there is a predator around the corner wanting to prey on them. Some predators like the falcon are known for their remarkable area hunting abilities using speed and precision to catch prey in mid-flight. Predators may also exhibit cooperative hunting behaviors. So they move together while individuals work together to increase their chances of capturing prey. So now we have looked at the adaptation of predators. How about prey? Do they just sit still and just wait for their predators to just prey on them? No, they have some other adaptation. They have some adaptation they have put in place that can help them to escape from their predators. Prey species have also evolved a range of adaptations to evade predation and increase their chances of survival. So we're going to look at some of these um, adaptations that, that have evolved over the years. Number one is speed and agility. The first one here is speed and agility. Prey species often possess adaptations that allow them to escape from predators through speed and agility. They may have long legs for running, streamlined bodies for quick movements, or wings for flying away from danger. Examples include antelopes, as you can see in the video. So the way it's jumping, so it can cover a long distance. So that's speed and agility. It can easily escape from predators, gazelles, and rabbits that can quickly dart away from pursuing predators. The next is defensive structures. Defensive structures. Prey species may have may have evolved physically structures 
uh, I mean to say, prey species may have evolved physical structures that provide protection against predators. Look at that picture. There's a, there's a um, hedgehog, we call it hedgehog or pork pines. So it has thorn on its body. So if you have a prey, if a predator wants to feed on it, it's going to, those thorns is going to um, hurt them and they will just have to let it go. Uh, animals like tortoise or turtle, they have strong shells, very hard shells. So animals cannot crush them. Some animals cannot crush them. So they just look at them and then they let, let them go. That's the defensive structures that they have that they have to protect them from their predators. The next is warning signals. Warning signals. Prey species may exhibit warning signals to alert potential predators of their unpalatability or toxicity. This can include bright colors, patterns or behaviors that signal danger. For example, when you have your poison dart frog, just as we have on the video, the, it displays vibrant colors that indicate their toxic nature, deterring predators from attempting to eat them. So it's a way of um, prey adaptation and to save them also from predators. The next we have is mimicry, mimicry. Or oh, some person said mimicry, mimicry. Some prey species have evolved to mimic. So this, this is all about mimicking a dangerous species. Whereas they are not dangerous, they are not poisonous, but they mimic it. So when you look at them, you look, ah, it looks like this uh, one that is like this. So they let them go. So they mimic the appearance or behavior of other organisms to deceive predators. So they are, the main thing is to deceive predators so they, they won't be eaten up. This can be seen in species that resemble poisonous or venomous counterparts leading predators to avoid them. An example is the viceroy butterfly, which closely resembles the toxic monarch butterfly, but it's not. So it looks like it, but it's not. So when um, the, um, their predator sees them, they just avoid them. They avoid them because tox and mon the monarch butterfly is toxic to their health. So when they see something that resembles it, they do not eat it. And the last that we have here is group behavior. The last we have here before the end of today's class is group behavior. Prey animals often exhibit group behaviors to reduce their individual risk of predation. You know, when, for example, like moving together, group, that's head animals, when you talk about hair, they, they move together in group, like wild beasts or zebras group together to create confusion. You know, when they're moving in, uh, together in full speed, their predators will not be able to catch up with them, especially if their predators are few. So it will be difficult for their predators to feed on them or to attack them, unlike when they move individual. So group behavior can help the swans to overcome their predators. School behavior is also observed in fish species, providing protection through numbers and synchronized movement so very quickly today i know you enjoyed today's class here you we have looked at arboreal habitats we are still on that i told you earlier on that we are still considering habitats so it's just a a subclass of habitats and we have looked at from all the way from habitat the definition of habitats the key components of habitats you know by now that the things that are essential necessary for every habitat is food, shelter, and water resources, and also interactions. Then we also, also looked at the types of habitat, terrestrial habitat, aquatic habitat, and arboreal habitat. We've also looked at the different factors that affect these different habitats. We've looked at them and also the adaptations of predators and adaptation of prey so very quickly i'm just going to be taking a random question from the best cell app based on habitat that we've learned i'll just pick one or two and i will leave you to answer the rest to attempt the rest to be sure that yes you've really gained something from the class you know you cannot sometimes you assume that i i think i know this but when you attempt it you will actually know if you knew that stuff or not so i will hold you towards attempt these questions after now when i'm um, when we are done with this class so i'm going to take just one or two questions random questions from what we have learned so far wow i love this question that i just have now i will answer them answer this one and leave it to answer the rest it says scientists that study habitat are called 
scientists that study habitat are called. We have option A, botanists, option B, biologists, option C, zoologists, and D, ecologists, and option E is pharmacists. So let's do a kind of um, elimination method and intelligence by, by trying to get the definition of each of those terms, botanists, study of plants. So no. We are talking about the scientists that study habitat. Then the next biologists that study of life, no. Then zoologists study of animals, no. Ecologists. Then we have pharmacists. Pharmacists definitely it is not. So the right answer there is ecologists. And I told us earlier on that habitat is still a subset. Let me use that word. Still a subtopic under ecology. So scientists that study ecology or that study habitat are called what? Ecologists. So the right option there is option G, ecology. So I, I'm going to assume, not assume, I'm going to um, plead with you to go through all the questions there and attempt them and see if you can actually do them so that when you come across real life situations in your exams, you can actually do them and see you in the next class. Thank you.